does take bravery. It does take courage. And the reason for that is it takes a bit of time to see results. You're not going to get it in the first six months. But then all of a sudden you're like, oh, all that time and effort that we have spent, we're getting some phenomenal results now with these early careers because we need these new ideas, need these new innovators and the new generation, they just think completely different. Tech talent is a hot topic in the industry. The field is growing at a phenomenal rate. High performance computing, generative AI, machine learning, big data, cloud, edge, 5G, 6G, quantum, blockchain. Yeah, there's a myriad of incredible technologies that have exploded in the last five or so years. And they all need people to make them a reality. In fact, Research by consultancy firm Corn Ferry, which we've linked to in the show notes, found that by 2030, there's due to be up to 85 million potential unfilled tech roles globally. That's roughly the population of Germany. Wow. The challenge is those jobs aren't attracting enough candidates or the right ones. In a poll with global tech chiefs conducted by Massachusetts Institute of Technology's Technology Review, 64% claimed candidates for their IT tech jobs lack the necessary skills or experience. Another 56% believe there's an overall shortage of candidates. But what if you threw away the rule book when it comes to hiring qualified candidates and attracted people with skills built in other areas or even built the right employee from scratch? Well, in this episode, we'll be looking at non-conventional routes into STEM careers and how looking outside the box might just be the solution to our talent crunch. You're listening to Technology Untangled, a show which looks at the rapid evolution of technology and unravels the way it's changing our world. We are hosts, Michael Bird and Aubrey Lovell. So as much as we love the technical side of this podcast, the machines, hardware, breakthroughs, and the incredible developments, it's the people who work in STEM professions that make it all happen. The thing is, the tech field can suffer from a lack of diversity of individuals and thought. So, Michael, when you think about the route into STEM industries, what is the first thing that comes to mind? Well, I guess probably going to university or, as you'd say, college. That's right. Yep. And while that certainly used to be the route you'd take, you know, you would study at grade school and then you'd step up into college or, as you might say, university, and then you basically glide into any number of STEM roles. That used to be the traditional route. But that misconception is old because STEM is so much more accessible in 2023. Meninder Randauer, or Manny for short, leads Hewlett Packard Enterprises' early careers program for the UK, Ireland, and Middle East. When I first took this job, it was just pretty much the intern and graduate door. For me, it's like, well, we need to do better. And how many doors can we open? Whether it's through an internship, a graduate scheme, apprenticeships, we've got an incredible STEM program that is led by everybody in that group is is doing it on top of their day job. They're all ambassadors, they're super passionate, they're volunteers. And that group is actually ran by an ex-apprentice who's been here for five years. And they go to local schools, local colleges, target individuals who literally are 11, 12, 13 years, 16 years old about why they should have a career in tech, but especially targeting those underprivileged backgrounds, different races, different cultures, different genders. We want to be as open as possible. So the STEM community, I thank them. They do an incredible job, but that's another way that we encourage young talent. And and that could be for a different perspective. That could be bringing them in for work experience. That could be us going to their school and college, doing something with them. We've also got something a little bit new that we've done over the last year called a T-level. So these are college students that have worked at HPE for 26 weeks. They kind of did a Monday and a Tuesday at HPE. The rest of it, they would go back into their college That's something new, right? We want to explore as many different opportunities to bring in young talent and or give them exposure to tech, right? Because if we're giving them exposure and they go into tech, even if it's a different company, ideally we'd like them at HPE, we're benefiting that person and we're benefiting the tech industry as well. And the last bit is we've launched virtual job experience. It's free training, four hours long in software engineering, pre-sales and sales. 
they learn about the company, they learn about the role, and they learn about what skills they need for those jobs. Really cool thing is they get a certificate at the end of it. They can put that on their CV. Now, there are so many ways to get a career in STEM and then so many opportunities to expand and grow once you're in a role. Apprenticeships are a key one and are growing in popularity. Where I am in the UK, the number of engineering related apprenticeships has increased by just over a quarter in the decade to 2021. Gaining qualifications on the job offers the promise of careers to people who may otherwise be overlooked due to not being suited to academia, which when you think about it is a little bit silly. Hi, I'm Stu Franks and I'm a development manager at Alsys Flight Limited. Alsys Flight themselves are a HPC integrator and managed services provider. I work with a small software team to develop our in-house software products and I also visit trade shows to show off those products. I didn't even know what supercomputers were when I started working with them. I dropped out of school during A-levels. I only finished the first of the two years. I do have some AS levels, um, but I, I started an apprenticeship in IT at a, a small local company to me. I heard about the job through a neighbor who actually worked there and said, oh, you know, we're looking for an IT apprentice. Would you be interested? And, you know, I was trying to do something other than education because I'd sort of reached that point where I wasn't really enjoying classes and listening and just taking notes and that. I didn't feel like I was, was quite going in or sticking or engaging enough. They definitely seem to be looking for a, a young apprentice, someone under the age of 20 from what I, I gathered, you know, to work with their only system admin they had at a time who had probably more years experience than I had years on the planet when I started there. So it seemed very much like a, a two-pronged thing. There's there's that risk of someone who's not necessarily going to come in and be effective immediately, but also someone young, learning things your way, first job. There's a lot of um, opportunity for growth there. And in that first month, I went from having never built a computer in my life to building over 50 different computers and stringing them together in a network to run HPC applications, specifically um, computational fluid dynamics. So that's things like simulating airflow and various other physics on oil rigs, uh, anything really to simulate environmental effects and optimize things like airflow, downforce, other keywords I've heard in my time but don't quite understand. It was really going into the deep end with that sort of stuff. And about 11 months, I want to say, into my career there was when the senior system admin left, which left me as a fresh 18-year-old looking after, I think it was about 400 nodes across 10 or so clusters and making sure that the CFD engineers' jobs were running and not failing. There were 15 of them and one of me, and that is certainly a sink or swim moment. It was just before my 17th birthday I started working, and yep, I am now 27, 10 plus years experience in HPC. People think I've either aged really well or I'm a liar. So, Aubrey, I don't know if you know, but I, I actually never went to university. No way. That's really interesting. How did you navigate all of that? Well, when I was in uh, year 13, which I guess is like 12th grade for you, I just was like, I'm just a bit done with sitting in a classroom and I really want to just get out there and do stuff. So I got a job in an IT department and that just sort of became a bit of a springboard for me. Now, I didn't do a formal apprenticeship, but actually working in that IT department was basically like an apprenticeship for me anyway. Like I learned so much and it was all on the job and I just absolutely loved it. And I realized I just thrived in that environment. So I really understand where Stu's at. Like, absolutely. it's University isn't necessarily for everyone. And um, certainly here in the UK, there are so many more opportunities around things like apprenticeships, but also just like, I think employers are way more open to it. Yeah. Yeah, which is great. No, I think it's really fascinating. I think it's great that you are a success story for that and the route that you decided to take. You know, at the time it was non traditional, but now you're seeing a lot more people go that route, whether it's a financial reason or just there's just so many more opportunities. Like you think about all the certifications that you can get just for tech without yeah. having to enter into a four year, you know, university or college. It's the opportunities are endless. Yeah. And I guess there's, there's an element of, like some of these jobs, it's a lot less about what you've learned at college or university and more about like 
the sort of stuff that actually is quite hard to pick up in like formal training. It's just like you sort of have to do the thing to be able to learn those things. So, I mean, that that's some of the biggest skills that I've learned, like how to problem solve and all of those sorts of things, which, yeah, I just sort of learned on the job. So I genuinely did not know that. Like, that's really interesting. Uh, fun fact of the day. Fun fact of the day. Stu and Michael are proof that a career in STEM doesn't have to just follow that straight path from grade school to university and then into a career. Although that is still obviously a very good route to take. But even the wonderful world of STEM can take you down all sorts of alleyways. Erin Young is a great case in point. She got into tech through a very unusual route, a history degree. Hi, so I'm Erin. I'm a research fellow working in the public policy program at the Alan Turing Institute. And just to give a bit of background on the Turing, if you haven't heard of us before, we undertake research in data science and AI to try and tackle the big challenges in science, society, the economy. And as part of that, we partner and collaborate with universities, industry, public sector to try to apply this research to real world problems. So I didn't realise it at the time when I was reading classics, but it was setting me up really nicely for what I do now. When I think back, actually, a lot of the skills, quite often called soft skills, or even though I don't really like that term, but a lot of the skills that I honed during my classics degree, so critical thinking and, you know, the like that are usually listed off as soft skills, are really, really helpful for working in STEM because we have a lot of very squarely technical people, so engineers, developers, and I'm heartened to see that this is happening more. We really need to take more of an interdisciplinary approach to technology to include social scientists and ethicists and people from humanities backgrounds to bring lots of different viewpoints. The idea of bringing in people from a variety of different backgrounds is absolutely vital here, be that from different academic disciplines, different social or ethnic backgrounds, or different age groups. But why? Why is it important to bring in and nurture new talent rather than relying on experienced candidates? They just bring in a lot of positive energy, passion. Uh, they're open to learning. They might not specifically know those skills or have the knowledge, but they just bring a raw enthusiasm to just want to do well. They're so grateful for the opportunity. So for us, it's what can we give them to have the best possible uh, career? It's bringing in those future leaders, those innovators, those thinkers of the industry. We want different thoughts and perspectives. You know, it's fine bringing loads of ex in experienced talent in, but that might be for a specific task, a project, a kind of business unit, you're going to need a good mix of experience, proven track record people and inexperienced people as well. Uh, what you don't want is just a team full of experienced people, masters who have done it before in different companies and industries. You've got an awesome team, but it's very short term. Yes, you know, some might stay for a very long time. But what happens if they take early retirement? What happens if they leave the company? They have taken all that knowledge, skill and experience out. Some of them as well might be a bit stuck in their ways. It might be quite hardened and you know a little bit of a rock. What we need is a couple of sponges, open to learning, open to, to new ways. From a business point of view, it can be very costly to get external talent. The recruitment cycles are much longer. You pay a premium to bring in the best talent as well. And it could be quite expensive and it's you're going to struggle with one retaining these people but two having succession plans so if you've got a very hot, top heavy team you want to bring in that conveyor belt you want to promote that homegrown talent that's going to increase your attention uh, and long-term loyalty as well great stuff now that said there are a few occasions where bringing in new talent maybe isn't enough on its own to get real diversity, you need to reach out to potential talent and convince them that tech is a viable career, reeling in talent, if you like. And to achieve greater diversity in tech, a major target of any career outreach program needs to be women. Women only represent 26% of the STEM workforce, according to a report by STEM Women. And that's not the only alarming statistic. 
In March 2023, a UK government report into diversity and inclusion in STEM found underrepresentation is present in many STEM settings, from classrooms to research facilities to boardrooms. Meanwhile, the National Science Foundation in the U.S. reported that between 2011 and 2021, the STEM workforce grew from 29 million to 34.9 million. And in those 10 years, there was an increase in diversity in terms of underrepresented minorities working in STEM sectors, and the women's share of the STEM workforce population grew at a faster rate than men. But of course, there's still a long way to go. And of course, we've linked all those stats in the show notes. So fortunately, there are groups out there doing just that. And one of those is the STEMETS, a UK-based outreach organisation. My name is Florian Fidignan. I am a manufacturing engineer by background, but also a science communication and policy nerd. So I work with a number of charities, but most prominently STEMET Futures. And we're an organisation looking to increase gender representation across the STEAM sectors. So I was a beneficiary of STEMETS. I'm now a chair of their youth board and a trustee on their charity board. So STEMETS was started 10 years ago with the core mission to increase gender representation across the STEM industry. So science, technology, engineering and maths. And then over time that has evolved into STEAM. So adding the arts into that as well. We're pretty small still, so I think a headcount of about 20-ish people. To date, we've engaged about 33,000 young people, young women and non-binary people across a number of interventions. So we have our shorter-term interventions, our medium-term interventions, and our long-term interventions. And the short to medium are all about inspiration. They're all about pulling young people in for maybe an hour to maybe a half day. And this includes like our big conferences, our hackathons that are really about teaching young people What is it to code? What does it mean to be a software engineer? What are the opportunities in STEM that you may never have considered? And teaching them over a longer period of time, like what it means to be a person in STEM. What are the opportunities in STEM? What jobs could you end up doing? What does the day-to-day life look like? How lucrative of a career might it be? And this usually takes place through things like the Youth Board programme, but most, I think, prominently through our mentoring programme. So students to STEMETs. So that's why we work with private organisations and they allow their employees to volunteer and they volunteer with the young people and they mentor them through a period of time in a structured programme. And I think that's honestly so valuable for them and gives the young people an opportunity to have a look into the world of STEM at a much earlier age. Bringing young people into tech is a great ambition. But of course, a STEM career doesn't have to look like a STEM career right off the bat. It can be a passion which builds from other angles as life goes on. Here's Erin Young. I think about this a lot. My career path hasn't been linear at all. It was quite a messy process um, in a fun way. And just to give a, a bit of background, I think would be helpful. So our project, we conduct... Uh, interdisciplinary data science and social science research. And our overarching aim is to explore ethical and economic and governance related issues, which stem from the underrepresentation of women and marginalized groups in AI. So we work with policymakers and industry stakeholders to try to inform policy measures and other interventions around this. But I think now when I connect the dots backwards, it makes complete sense that I find myself at the Institute solving these problems. And, you know, I I kind of didn't know what I wanted to do. I worked in marketing for a little bit. I then went into fintech and that's when I started to realise where other passions, passions lie as well. So I did my PhD, my DPhil at Oxford in education and a field called STS, which is science and technology studies. So essentially sociology of technology. And before that, I was a researcher at Stanford and the Oxford Internet Institute. And then I've also worked for the UN in Paris, Kantar, Thomson Reuters in New York. So my career's moved around a bit. But essentially, I, as I went through my career journey, I realized I had this deep interest in how we interact with technologies and why they're built in certain ways and how they affect us and combining this with what kind of effects are these having on society more broadly and particularly inequalities in society and so in each job I had I found myself getting closer and closer to the current role of leading the women in data science and AI project. (laughs) 
think we can safely say that the misconception that there's a straight route into a career in STEM has been well and truly debunked. And equally, what we're learning is that once you're in a STEM area, this sort of whole new world of opportunity and career diversification opens up to you. And as Erin and Stu have demonstrated, it's not necessarily part of your plan at the start. What's also becoming clear is that the traditional hard skills, coding, vocational degrees, and years of experience aren't the only thing that matters. Soft skills such as communication and creative problem solving are just as valuable when looking for good candidates. Here's Stu to explain. Personally, what I look for in a CV and someone who's who's applying for a job is some semblance of who they actually are. You know, you, you can get a lot of CVs where it's just kind of education, education, certification, list of coding languages I do. And I, I don't know who you are. I don't know how you'll fit into the team. I think there's far more, like I said, about soft skills in working. That, those are far more important than necessarily whether you've got a 1-1 one, one or a 2-1. You know, I want to know what you're interested in, what sort of projects you've done on your own time, because that shows the sort of the drive that you have to go, well, here's one of my interests and here's how I can connect it to a skill. It's all about finding those sorts of things. And we've hired people who don't necessarily have that formal education, but have put together a few servers in their own time. And they've connected that to, you know, some sort of other download server. And it's that sort of stuff that it's the the drive, I think, is more important uh, in a lot of cases. We, we do have a bit of a vetting process when it comes to hirings. There's plenty of opportunities for questions, seeing what the answers come through as and how true they seem. And at the end of the day, there's no better way than sitting in the room with someone for an hour and chatting tech really you know whether it's um showing them through some tools that we make seeing what questions they ask or seeing how much they seem to understand what's going on or talking to them about some of their personal projects and you know it's not necessarily foolproof but i think it's a good enough way to get a good understanding for who someone is um and what their ability is because at the end of the day i you don't have to you, you wouldn't be going for a graduate position if you could do it all already right it's about how capable you are to learn and listen and communicate. Manny agrees. In fact, he'd go further and say that even once an apprentice starts, showcasing the skills they are building and helping develop those is way more important than actually learning the specifics of the job. I kind of really don't care too much what they're actually doing in terms of their day job. What I'm looking for is really good people that are happy, healthy, well, performing to a high level, and I'm giving them real life skills that are going to help them not in the career today but also for the career in the future as well wherever they move to so our four key pillars is soft skills mindset well-being and high performance so can we teach them about communication teamwork how do they present themselves it's their first job how do they organize their, their diary and their time how do they kind of figure out from a financial point of view, what do we do with our finances? It's our first paycheck. <laughs> we want to give them really tangible skills that it doesn't matter what business they go into. You can not need to speak with people or present your thoughts and ideas or manage your time. But from a mindset perspective, number two, we want to teach them about having a growth mindset, an open mindset. It's okay to make mistakes. It's okay to fall over. It's about picking yourself up learning from it and continue moving forward. Sometimes you have to move sideways. Sometimes you have to move backwards. As long as you're moving, you're still making progression. And it's okay to ask a bunch of silly questions. But well-being, I created this program just before COVID. I never realised how important well-being was going to be. I'm kind of glad I kind of got <laughs> lucky. I guess with my research, when kind of life hits you the hardest, we want to talk about these topics and be proactive very early in the career. And I get early careers going, what are we talking about stress for? Why are we talking about these topics? And then six months later, they go, yeah, I'm pretty stressed. I'm glad you spoke about that six months ago. <laughs> but equally as well, we focus on the cool side of stuff of high performance of, we want them to have a long and successful career, earn whatever money they want to earn. I really drill down into why are you doing this? Yes, it's a job. Yes, you'll get a salary. But what is your why? What strengths can you bring? Of course, in order to get young people into these posts, you've got to get them to apply. So how do you do that? We asked Florian what a standard journey might look like for a young person being engaged by the STEMETs, all the way through to getting that first role. 
So our young people hear about us through, through multiple different ways. We're quite present and active on social media, but we also work really closely with schools. So that young person probably heard about us from a school and has been encouraged to attend one of our shorter term events that are coming up where they might hear from just a couple of um, STEM professionals or they might get more involved if it's like an active activities. One thing that we always promise is that it's fun filled free and always has food so they'll attend the event and they'll get those three things they might receive a laptop if they are part of a longer term intervention and need it equipment because we never want access to it to be a reason why they're unable to engage with our programs so they might do that and they might love it hopefully if they do love it they then have access to our kind of locked or private social media which is only for our young people and that's not an opportunity for them to access content relating to role models they may never have heard of and how tips on how to apply for universities and all that kind of good stuff. And hopefully they'll start to build their network within those platforms. And then over time, they'll be encouraged to apply for a longer term intervention. So our mentorship program more specifically. So all of these are kind of like big tech employers. And that program will usually start around August time, just before they get into school and run until about November, December time. They'll meet their mentor, they'll set up their mentor meetings, and then they'll do a bunch of different activities with their mentor, without their mentor, by themselves. And hopefully over time, they'll kind of develop a love for STEM if they haven't already. But every journey is pretty unique for for our young people. That sounds pretty amazing. It presents a potential issue, though. From an organisational perspective, taking on young people, providing mentors from among your busy staff pool and hiring candidates without experience is a long-term investment. They aren't going to step into the role. It could take years. It could never happen. They could decide this new world isn't right for them and leave. So what's the answer? And is it ultimately worth the effort? Here's Manny again. It does take bravery. It does take courage. And the reason for that is it takes a bit of time to see results. You're not gonna get it in the first six months, 12 months, it might even be the first 18 months. But then all of a sudden the magic starts to happen when year two starts to hit year three. And then all of a sudden you're like, oh, all that time and effort that we have spent, we're getting some (laughs) phenomenal results now with these early careers. So you've got to have a bit of patience. You've got to have a bit of time, but equally as well, it's a super important part of the business in any tech company, because we need these new ideas, need these new innovators and the new generation, they just think completely different. I thought I was young, I'm definitely not, to be honest. <laughs> and with the way I think of stuff, and I, even I'm blown away with stuff, I'm like, oh, actually, why don't we just do it that way? Actually, why are we doing things a certain way? Bringing different people to the mix is super important because HP has been going on for a very, very long time. And that's the way it's going to continue growing because we are all custodians. We're all here for a short amount of time. We'll take it to a certain level and then the next generation will improve it a little bit more and they'll pass it on to somebody else. There's a lot of talk about what the employer gets from employees working in STEM. And obviously there are jobs out there and employers want to know that they are getting the right people and that their businesses will benefit. And there are opportunities for growth, for upskilling and reskilling. That creates an interesting ecosystem of individuals getting into STEM, feeling supported, wanting to give back and bringing more people on board. And that in itself can pay huge dividends to firms willing to invest the time and money in bringing in candidates from the outside. Here's Florian. I'm quite fortunate that the flexibility to volunteer has been afforded to me. It means that I can take an hour out of the day to go to a school and do a school talk or support a STEM club and then get back to my desk and carry on with the rest of my day and meetings and whatever with like very little drama. So that's something I definitely recognise has made a huge difference to how I'm able to do so much. I'm really blessed to have great employers and to have had great employers who are really flexible. The ability to give your employees learning and development opportunities and professional development opportunities just makes you a more interesting human a more empathetic human. And I think those are the type of people that make up a really fantastic team. So by volunteering, by engaging with the organisations that I work with, I'm raising my profile, I'm learning new things, I'm building networks, I'm kind of building a name for the organisation as well. There are loads of benefits, potentially intangible in some ways, but very much to do with kind of the individual themselves and kind of what they bring back to the organisation because they're volunteering, because they're engaging 
um, outside of the world of work. Like I wouldn't be here sitting chatting to you if I hadn't been involved in those programs. There are so many people who have stories like mine. So that's the first thing that employers can do. It's great advice. So what would some of our other guests suggest to candidates or organisations interested in finding more diverse STEM candidates? Well, for Stu, it's all about looking past the paperwork. I would say further education isn't always the answer. Find how you learn, find what interests you and start reaching out, look for places. And if you can show that you are interested and that you can learn, that means just as much and you can grow and you can adapt. There's a lot out there. Manny's advice is for those organisations who haven't taken a plunge yet and are still solely hiring experienced staff. I actually speak to a lot of companies about this, you know, a lot of our key partners or, or other kind of customers as well, because they've kind of seen what we've done at HP. I think the first thing is we were in the same position not too long ago. We had to start from somewhere. I would really just recommend of firstly, as a company, what is your culture? What is your values and what are you good at? And kind of build a program off that because what you want to do is you don't want to attract all of the talent. You don't want to attract the best talent. You want to attract the, the best talent that's right for your culture and your values. And that's how you're going to retain them. So what's your USP? What's really good for your company? I'd look into that and I'd start off small. Is it a few apprentices? Maybe we get a couple of interns, a couple of graduates and build up from there. I wouldn't go into a big bang approach. I take things and build over time. You're definitely going to get the naysayers. You're definitely going to get people saying it's not worth it. What's the point in putting all this time, effort and resources? We're training talent for the future. They're going to go to a different company. Reality is this generation, they're going to jump jobs a lot more than previous generations. I think that's just kind of a fact. I think the key is, though, retaining that very best talent, the top talent that fits your value and culture. I think that's what we should be aiming for. And then equally as well, the early careers that do come in, have they had the best possible time in the company? Because let's just say they go to a different company. What we want is, would they recommend Hewlett Packard Enterprise to their friends and family? And if they do, we've done a great job because who knows, we might get a friend or cousin, whoever of this person join us as well. So if you're listening to this and thinking about a career in STEM, firstly, great choice. Secondly, welcome. The industry can't wait to hear from you, whoever you are or wherever you're coming from. Hey, sometimes they even hire podcasters. You've been listening to Technology Untangled. We've been your hosts, Michael Bird and Aubrey Lovell. And a huge thanks to our guests, Erin Young, Florian Fidenio, Maninda Rendawa, and Stu Franks. You can find more information on today's episode in the show notes. And this is the seventh episode in the fourth series of Technology Untangled. And next time, we're exploring our ever-increasing thirst for bandwidth in sport and what teams, venues, and organizations are doing about it. Do make sure you subscribe on your podcast app of choice so you don't miss out and to check out on the last three series. This episode was produced by Sam Datapollin and Zoe Anderson with production support from Harry Morton, Alicia Kempson, Allison Paisley, Alyssa Mitri, Camilla Patel, Alex Podmore, and Chloe Sewell. Our social editorial team is Rebecca Wissinger, Judy Ann Goldman, Katie Guarino, and our social media designers are Alejandra Garcia, Carlos Alberto Suarez, and Ambar Maldonado. Technology Untangled is a Lower Street production for Hewlett Packard Enterprise. Thank you.